Kia ora, I'm the Kiwi Coder, and this is episode 12 of AI. In this episode, we're going to be expanding on the behavior tree editor built in the previous episode from this crappy looking thing to this. So here we can see the tree is now laid out vertically, which makes the best use of your screen real estate. The nodes are highlighted indicating which state they're in, so you can see exactly what the behavior tree is executing at runtime. And even at runtime, new nodes can be created and the properties of those nodes can be modified. There is a blackboard view here, which nodes can read and write to, making it possible to pass data between any level of the tree. And the node types are actually highlighted, which makes it easy to see the structure of the tree at a glance. When I exit play mode, everything returns back to normal. The entire tree is basically styled using USS style sheets and UI builder, which just makes it incredibly easy to like tweak the look and feel of your tree in real time, even at runtime. And each node is represented using a custom UXML document, which makes it easy to just add uh, new fields and labels like this description field that I've added here. So this video is pretty long. I'll split it into chapters again, which you can find links for in the description below. So I think with that, let's just get into it. Thank you to all the Patreon supporters this month. If you are interested in supporting this channel or the project files associated with these videos, then please head over to Patreon and check it out. Cheers. Sweet, so the first thing to do is adding the double click handler to the behavior tree. So if we open up the behavior tree editor script, um, first thing we need to do is include the unity editor.callbacks namespace. Now we need to define a new method uh, which returns a bool called on open asset. And this method should take two parameters, one for the instance ID of the asset and the other for the line number, which we can ignore for now. So we need to apply the on open asset attribute to the method. And inside the method, we just check if the selection dot active object, if it is a behavior tree, uh, then we just call the open window function and we can just return true if we handle the asset, otherwise return false. Sweet. So if we hop back into unity, uh, now if I close the behavior tree editor window and double click the behavior tree asset, we get the editor window popping up again, which is totally awesome. Sweet. So the next step is going to be laying out this tree vertically rather than horizontally. We can get part of the way there in code by just adjusting the orientation from horizontal to vertical. And what this does is basically changes the orientation in which the edges uh, sort of enter and exit these ports. So rather than horizontally, um, they will be aligned sort of vertically. Unfortunately, this doesn't change the orientation of the actual nodes themselves though. Uh, so I haven't found a way where you can kind of completely do that from code. Um, but what we can do is uh, create a new UI toolkit UI document. And this, uh, this document is going to be the structure to represent an individual node. So I'm going to call this node view. And if we open this up in the UI builder, uh, we can just see it sort of created like an empty kind of hierarchy here with nothing in it. So uh, first of all, we need to get all of these elements from a node into our custom XML. So we can do that using the UI toolkit debugger. And if I dock this down here, select pick element and then pick one of these, um, we can see the entire structure of a node view. Um, and one method would be just to kind of like copy all of these elements and uh, just create it manually in the hierarchy here. But a faster method is with the node view selected, we can open the UXML dump uh, thing here and copy all of this and then paste it into our node view file that we just created. So if I open this up in Visual Studio and just paste over the top like that, uh, now I can get rid of these ports because they are added dynamically at runtime. So we don't want them to be statically defined here. Um, and also this node view container, this outer container, uh, we don't need that. So to link this XML to our node view class, uh, what we can do is uh, call the second constructor on the graph view node class, which takes a path to a UI file. So uh, to call that uh, inside the constructor, we can just call it via the base. And here we just pass the asset slash data builder, uh, sorry, slash UI builder slash node view dot UXML. So pass the path to the file that we just created and uh, now if we hop back into unity with any luck everything should look uh, completely broken 
which is actually a good sign. It means it's now using the uh, our custom XML. So by using the custom XML, we've lost all of the default styling. So we need to recreate that. And it's not, um, it's not actually too much work once you know the sort of main pieces to it. So to do that, if we hop back over to UI Builder, um, we can create a new USS and I'm going to put it in the same location um, and I'm going to call it node view style. Cool. So this uh, style sheet is basically going to let us uh, style the individual elements. So just quickly, I'm um, looking at the actual XML that we imported before. We've now got a bunch of new nodes. So the node border is the main container for the node uh, with the background and stuff. And the selection border is the blue outline uh, that would appear when you hover over a node. And then inside the node border, we've got basically everything else, the title, um, inside this contents, we've got the input and output containers, which are holding the ports here. So um, what we wanna do is basically give this node border a background. And to do that, uh, we can create a new selector to target that object by typing hash and then typing the ID of the object, which is node border in this case. So if I select that and then go down to the background, I can then set the color to like red and we can now change the color of all of the nodes in the tree, which is pretty cool. So I'm just gonna set it to this, uh, this boring old gray color for now. And uh, a couple more things to do is I'm gonna set the uh, border color. Um, I'll just set it to red now so you can actually see what's going on. If I set the one pixel, uh, the border width to one pixel, and the border radius to five, we now have a border around the nodes. Um, so I'm just going to make that a little bit darker, something like that, and cool. So the next step is going to be, uh, I want to move this input port up here and this output port down here. Um, but to do that, I kind of need to push this text in between the two. Um, so the easiest way I've found to do this is basically uh, by taking the title object and dragging it in between the input and output uh, objects here. Now I've modified the XML, so I need to save that before the changes take effect. And now we can see the text appears in between the input and output containers. Okay, so the next step is gonna be uh, horizontally aligning the input container. So this port appears in the center here. And we can do that using this selector by targeting the input uh, container or the input sort of element here. and. If I select that input and go to the align section, we can just set uh, justify or align items center. And we can do a similar thing for the output. Uh, we can set the align items to center. Cool, so it's looking pretty good, except the items aren't quite aligned. And to debug this, we can use the UI toolkit debugger and select pick element. And now in here, uh, we can actually mouse over the the elements and see that this label here is the reason why everything is sort of off center. So what I wanna do is actually align this port container, uh, make it align its children vertically rather than horizontally like it is now. This port is actually added dynamically at runtime. So I haven't figured out a way to do this directly from USS, but it's easy enough to do in code. So where we create the input port, <clears throat> I can just set the input style dot flex direction equal to flex direction dot column and similarly for the output port i can just set the flex direction to column reverse cool so hopping back into unity we should now see these ports aligning over each other uh, perfectly nice um, okay so the next thing to do is adding back in that blue selection outline that we had before i'm just going to move these nodes down um, because just to make it look a little bit better. Cool, sweet. So in UI Builder, uh, just to remind you, this selection border is the border for the uh, for the nodes. So we can target that and adjust its styling by creating a new selector, uh, just starting with hash, uh, so we can target it by ID. And here, I'm just gonna set the border color to like some blue color here, and also set the width so we can see it to one pixel. Cool. Um, so this node view object here is aligning its children uh, top to bottom, which is why you see the main container here and then the border appearing underneath. So to get it to actually appear around the entire thing, there's a trick that you can do 
in uh, CSS where we set the position to absolute and then set the left, top, right and bottom all to zero and that will basically make it uh, wrap around the parent object. Uh, so now we can set a border radius of say like five pixels and we've got a nice looking border. Cool, so I don't actually want the border to appear by default so I'm gonna set the width to zero pixels. And now I only want it to appear when uh, this is in a hovered state. So we can use a new selector and type in hover and using this angle bracket just means um, select the direct descendant. So in this case, the node view will have the hover state and we wanna set the selection border child. So that's what this is basically doing. Now we just type out the selection border, the name of the child, and now we can adjust the hover state for the selection border object. So in this case, I wanna set the uh, pixel width of the border to one pixel. Now when I mouse over the object, the, the selection border appears and when I uh, my mouse leaves it disappears but um, the I want the border to stay when the object is selected um, so we can do a similar thing but this time we'll use the selected state and uh, yeah adjust the selection border set the width uh, the border width to one pixel and now if I select the object the border stays which is pretty cool so there's one more um, fancy thing that we can do and here we can if uh, we're if we're hovering over a selected uh, selection border, <laughs> then we can adjust the selection borders uh, width to two pixels. Cool. So now if I select this element, uh, when I hover over a selected element, the border width changes from one pixel to two pixels, which is looking pretty cool. Nice. Okay, so the next thing I want to do is actually um, just adjust the width of these nodes um, so they're all kind of the same size. Uh, I think this will make it align better um, rather than having these kind of weird kinks in the edges here. So to do that, if we just um, click one of these, we can see that the node view has a bunch of uh, classes associated with it. And uh, you can address these classes using the dot notation. So I'm going to use the dot node um, in this scenario. Uh, so here I'm just going to type dot node and then this is going to let me change the properties of all of the nodes. So <clears throat> um, what I want to do is inside the size, it's just set the minimum width to 150. And now all of the nodes have got 150 width, which in my opinion, I think it looks a little bit nicer having everything the same size. And um, the alignment isn't quite working. and I'm not 100% sure why, but to fix it, all we need to do is set the margin to zero, and now things will align uh, a bit nicer, which I think looks uh, looks pretty cool. Sweet, so um, the next thing I want to do is, oh, there's one thing I actually forgot, and on the selection border, because it's wrapping this entire object now, it's actually blocked the input, and we, can't, we can no longer uh, sort of drag out of here. Uh, it doesn't let us. So the reason for that is the selection border, we need to just disable picking and we can set that to ignore here. So again, I've changed the XML. So if I just save that, um, we can now see the, the input is working again and I can uh, connect these nodes up. Cool, okay. So the next thing I wanna do is just add like a little description beneath the title text here. So if I drag this up a little bit and go down to the controls, I can then add a label uh, underneath the title here. So if I just drag this in and set this to description uh, and I'll just give it some text like this is a description. Cool, so if I hit save, now all of these nodes should have this, uh, this description text. So I kind of want to make the title uh, look a little bit different. So I'm going to target this title label here uh, using a new selector and I'm gonna set the, uh, if I go down to the text section, I can set it to bold and just increase the font size a little bit. And then similarly for the description, um, I can then just decrease the font size down to something like 10. Cool, I think that looks pretty cool. Um, there's a couple more things that I wanna do and just drag this divider uh, beneath this uh, description object here and now I can um, actually target this divider divider, and set the minimum pixel height 
for the divider to one pixel and then set the background color to just some kind of gray color here. Cool. Um, I think I just need to save that. Yeah. So now we have these, uh, these kind of lines appearing above and below the text, which in my opinion looks quite cool. Sweet, so now it's time to add some kind of coloring to these and I want to color the nodes based on which type they are. Um, so we have these sequence of nodes which are all composites. So I'm actually just going to create a decorated node in here just for a little bit of variance and uh, just yeah, add this in and uh, I can only connect one of them up. Well, uh, that'll do for now. So yeah, we have the root node type, the decorated node, the composite node, and these are all action nodes. Um, so what we can do is basically add uh, classes kind of similar to the node class. We can add custom classes from code and then use those classes to create selectors and style them uh, in the style sheet. So if we just hop over to where we create the node view class, I'm just gonna create a new function here called setup classes. And in this function, uh, I'm going to uh, basically do a switch on the type of node it is. Um, and I just need to delete this. So here we can call add to class list and we just give it a name of a class to add. This is just like an arbitrary kind of tag that you can add and it will be added to all nodes that are of type action node. So for the composite, I'm just gonna do a similar thing. Um, just add the composite class for the decorated node. I'm gonna add the decorated class and for the root node, I'm going to add the root class. Cool, so now hopping back into Unity, if we open up the UI Toolkit debugger, we should actually be able to see that all of the nodes have got these different classes and now we can use those classes uh, inside the style sheet to style them differently. So I wanna change the color of this input container here, uh, just to give it like a different color. So if I start with the action class and then target the input container, which is a child of anything tagged with action. Now in here, I can set the background color uh, to like red, for example. Cool, um, so if I just create the rest of the classes, so we had composite, we had decorator, and we had the root. Cool, so now I just wanna give all of these different colors. Um, I just wanna show you this like really cool tool, and it's called colors.co. And if you're terrible at designing things like I am, uh, you can just hit space and it will generate new color themes for you. And if you like a particular color, um, so I want to find like a green, for example, for the action nodes. So maybe this color or I don't know, um, maybe this color could be quite cool. So if I lock that one in, now if I wanna find uh, maybe like a purple for the decorators, and I wanna find like a red for the root node and like a, um, maybe that one will be okay for the root node and then a yellow for the composite. So if I just keep hitting space until I get the color I want, um, something like that, cool. So now I can uh, basically copy these values. So take that green color uh, for the action node and set that to the background color down here now all of the action nodes have this green color and the yellow was for the composite. So if I set the background color there, now the composite nodes have got this yellow color. Um, the purple, I think I was going to use for the decorator. So if I set that blue color or purple color there and then for the red or the pink, I was gonna use that for the root node. So if I set that on the root node background color here. Cool, oh yeah, so the root node doesn't actually have any inputs. So its input container is, is empty, it has no height. So one thing that we can do is adjust the minimum height of the, just on the root node input container. It's only gonna affect the root node. Uh, we can set the minimum height to something like 20 and that just forces it to have a particular height. Cool, so I think this tree is starting to look a lot cooler now. It's, uh, it's starting to look pretty professional <laughs> in my opinion. Uh, so I think it's time to move on to the next section. 
So this next step is gonna be adding undo redo support to the editor. Uh, so when I move a node and I hit undo, I just want it to return to the previous position. So that's pretty easy to do. Inside the node view class, uh, all we need to do here is, um, oh, first of all, I just need to add the using Unity editor namespace. And then inside set position, uh, we just need to call undo.record objects, passing in the node and a name for the operation. So I'm just gonna call this uh, set position and then afterwards uh, just call edit utility dot set dirty which I've found um, helps uh, maintaining or basically persisting uh, changes after an assembly reload um, sometimes they seem to get lost straight after uh, so this, this seems to help cool um, so now if we test this out in unity Dun, 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 dun. Cool, so if I move this and then hit undo, um, it looks like nothing happened, but if I just um, reload the tree, you can actually see the position was uh, reverted back to what it was, but the tree view didn't update. Um, so to update that, uh, we can just go to the behavior tree view and uh, hook into the undo redo event. So this is called, um, uh, what is it? Undo redo performed. So you can just create a new method here called on undo redo and then hit alt enter and here um, all we need to do really is just uh, repopulate the view so I can just call populate view passing in the tree and then call asset database dot save assets uh, which just seems to kind of refresh the um, inspector um, and the project view and stuff like that a little bit better cool so testing this out again in unity uh, moving that and hitting undo awesome cool so the next step is going to be undo redo of edge deletion and creation um, so this is actually again pretty simple just inside the behavior tree we already have these two functions um, add child and remove child so here we just pretty much do the same thing just do undo dot record object passing in the object that you're modifying and give it a name for the operation which i'm just going to call add child and just copying that down for all of the different cases. Um, just make sure to pass in the new objects that has been updated like this. Cool. And I've also got this editor utility set dirty afterwards. I don't think I covered that in the previous video. So that's just something I added. Cool. Uh, so for the remove child, it's exactly the same thing. Um, I'm just going to call that operation remove child, passing in the decorator. I'm also going to copy the editor utility. Um, as well, I'll do that in a minute and just moving this down for composite and then adding the edit editor utility dot set dirty. I don't know, the, the um, Unity like manual says that I don't need to do this, but I found it doesn't work very well if I don't do it. So I'm a bit confused by the documentation, but this seems to work anyway. Um, Cool, so now we should be able to undo and redo edge deletion and creation. So if I delete this edge and then hit undo and then hit redo, awesome. Uh, and if I create an edge, so dragging like this one over here like this and now uh, hit undo, awesome. And it recreated that one and redo, cool, sweet. That is looking good. Okay, so for node deletion and creation, uh, it's pretty much the same thing. It's more of a two-step process. First, we create the object and add it. So that needs to be undone. And the other thing is just adding it to this list uh, here. This also needs to be undone. So this one is pretty easy. <clears throat> it's uh, just using the same method, undo record object, passing in the object that we're modifying. So in this case, it's the behavior tree itself. So we can just pass in this because nodes is a property of the behavior tree. And then for the add object to asset, uh, here we need to do something slightly different and do record created, uh, register, register created object undo, passing in the node and, um, oh, I'm just gonna update this to be create node. And yeah, just change the string to be create node. Cool. Okay, so for the delete node, um, it's pretty much, yeah, the same again. So for uh, when we modify the list, we just need to record a delete operation. Um, and then for the remove object from asset, I've found replacing that with undo.destroyObjectImmediate. 
this seems to work. Um, so yeah, that seems to be the replacement. Okay, so now I'm trying this out in the editor. So if I create an object and hit undo, it uh, destroys it. And if I hit redo, it recreates it, which is cool. And there is an error here, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, yeah, and if I delete this object and then hit undo, it, uh, it re reappears. So this error is happening just because I've deleted an object that is uh, previously uh, being rendered in the inspector. So that's pretty easy to fix just inside the um, inspector view here, just uh, inside this function here. Um, we can just check if the target is still alive before rendering it. So we can just say if editor.target is alive, basically then call the inspector GUI. If it's been destroyed, this will fail and we won't call that, which will be good. So just one final test. So if I delete this, oh, let me just clear these errors. Uh, yeah, so if I delete this, re undo, redo, awesome. It's all looking good. Okay, so that's pretty much it for undo, redo. Okay, so the next section is going to be adding runtime editing of this behavior tree. So the first thing to do is uh, currently we're only showing a behavior tree when we select a behavior tree asset. I wanna change that so when we select a game object that has a behavior tree runner component, it displays the asset that that runner component is pointing to. So just switching over to the behavior tree editor. Where is it? Oh man, I got so many files. Okay, this guy here. So here we just check if we have no trees, like if there was no tree selected, then we just want to check if the selection.active game object is not null, then we want to try and get the behavior tree runner component from it. So I'm just going to copy this and just call get component behavior tree runner. Dun, dun, dun. Nice. Um, so now I just want to check or well, basically, yeah, just check if there was a runner component on that game object, then just set the tree equal to the runner component tree. Nice. So <clears throat> in the normal world, this would work, except I put this uh, this check in, which uh, actually screws it up in this case, uh, because the asset is a cloned asset and it's not, you can't open it in the editor and stuff and whatever. So what we need to do is just check if the application is playing uh, then we pretty much just ignore that check. Uh, so we can just remove this check uh, while the application is sort of playing. And if we're in the editor, then we just want to be extra safe and do that check. Cool. So that is, that's good. So that should um, pretty much work, except there is a problem. Of course there's a problem. There's always problems. Uh, that is literally the life of a programmer, just problems all day, all night. Uh, so we have this, uh, root node and it's cloned and the tree is cloned except we can't see these cloned nodes in here it's still displaying all of the old stuff and that is because I screwed up the behavior tree uh, clone function in the previous video uh, where is it so the behavior tree view I'm not finding my files behavior tree this guy here so the clone function here um, this is basically, it's assigning the root node, but I forgot to clone this list of nodes here uh, for the cloned tree. So we actually need to create a new list here um, and go equals new list of nodes. And here I'm gonna create a new function called traverse. And this is gonna do a depth first traversal starting from a root node and taking in an action uh, an action which takes a node as a parameter and this is just like a visitor function to basically apply to each node of the tree so actually I'll just call this node because it, it's probably not the root node most of the time so here we just check if we have a node then we just uh, invoke oops then we just uh, invoke the visitor function passing in the node and then we get the children of that node just calling our get children function and now we just go children dot for each uh, node in the tree. Then we call traverse, basically recursively call traverse, passing in the visitor function and bailing out. And that is literally a depth first traversal done 
in three lines of code. Oh my God, bring it on interviews. Okay, so now uh, we go nodes dot for each and no. So what do we do now? So now we want to traverse the tree starting from the root node, uh, starting from the root node and passing in a new fancy function called, um, what is it called? It's called, <clears throat> well, this one is going to just go tree.nodes.add each node into that list. Um, so we basically fill that list with each node of the new tree, starting from the tree, the new tree's root node. Cool, so that pretty much works. And now if we go back into here and hit the play mode and check it all out. So if I double click this cloned tree, yeah, we can now see all of the cloned objects in here, which is totally awesome. Sweet, so next thing to do, when I come out of play mode, it's still showing the one-time tree, and if I was to touch this at this point, I think the entire world would fall down. So um, what we need to do is refresh the selection uh, each time the we enter and exit play mode. So we can for that, we can hook into the on enable and the on disable, on disable <laughs> events. And here we just call application is, oh, what is it? It's called like application play mode state changed. And here, play mode state change. We just create a new function. I'll enter that function. And we do the old unsubscribe, resubscribe trick here uh, because that's what the forums on Unity told me to do. So uh, that's the way that you should do it, I think. It works pretty solidly. Just kind of make sure that you don't have double subscriptions and you're always unsubscribed at the right time, etc. So this parameter that gets passed in has four different options. Um, so we can do a switch on the obj thing um, which is just like the state of the editor basically and i'll enter to fill out those cases and all i want to do is just uh, call on selection change when we have entered edit mode and also when we have entered play mode call on selection change sweet so now all of this should work absolutely flawlessly apart from all of the other bugs that i still have to fix but <laughs> if i hit play Oh no, it didn't work. Yeah, sweet. So now we have the clone version. And if I unselect, awesome. It goes back to the boom, boom, boom. Yeah, cool. So we now have an actual runtime version of the tree, which we can kind of edit and stuff. Um, so if I dock the console down here, you can see all the messages printing out. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So if I change this to like Billy Bob uh, Jones, now we have Billy Bob Jones 2.3, Billy Bob Jones 2.3, amazing, uh, which is totally cool. So that works for simple um, things, but if I create a node, everything crashes, and yeah, again, the world falls over. So basically we can't do this add object to asset inside the create node of the behavior tree uh, because it's just not allowed, so don't do it. So basically just check if the application is playing uh, sorry, if it's not playing, if we're in editor mode, then we're allowed to do it and it's safe. Okay, cool. So that's the solution to that one. <clears throat> there is a, another smaller issue, which is kind of quite a cool issue actually. Uh, if we push play mode and we have one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, if I reorder these nodes, I actually want them to print in a different order um, because now we have two on the left. We have one in the middle and three on the right. So I actually want to sort these children based on their horizontal position. Uh, so what we can do for that is inside the node view, we can create a new function here called dun 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 dun, um, sort children. And here, uh, what we want to do is basically sort the children. <laughs> so uh, it's only worth sorting the children if we're a composite node. So first, just check that. Um, so node as composite node. And if we are a composite node, then we do composite node dot children dot sort. And we create a new function called sort by horizontal position. And I'll enter that stuff and it will generate a nice function for us where we can basically check the nodes X uh, position. I'm just going to call this like left and right, I guess, because it's kind of confusing with the X and Y. Um, so now what we do here, we need to return an integer. Uh, so we first just check if the node's X position is less than the node's right X position, then return negative one, otherwise return one. Cool, so now we have a sort function 
Finally, we just need to call this from the behavior tree view uh, every time we move something. So we can hook into the on graph change event and just check if the graph view change dot uh, has a moved elements thing, then we know something's changed. Um, well, does not equal to null. So here we can just call nodes dot for each uh, node in the old thingy majig, do it like that. And now we go node view, view equals n as node view. There's gotta be a shorter way to do this. I'm not sure, but um, now we can just call view dot sort children and we are in the money at this point. So if I then go back into here and one last thing, yeah, hit play mode. Okay, so now we have one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. If I move this over and move this over like this and move this over, now we have one, three, is that right? No, we have two, one, three. So if I clear this, is that, yeah. So we got two, I don't actually know if this, yeah, two, one, three, two, one, three, awesome. So that works, yeah, if I then, uh, clear this or I guess maybe move this over here uh, one so we should have two three one now two two three one awesome and I can even like move the weight node to like a different point um, so what does it do now yeah so now it's basically waiting and then doing one two three so it kind of looks correct I guess sweet so yeah, I think that's it for the runtime editing. Next step is gonna be uh, displaying the state of the nodes at runtime. Alrighty, so for this section, I just wanna display uh, which portions of the tree are currently executing by displaying the node state to the editor. Um, and I'm gonna do this in much the same way by like that the color of these nodes is, is done currently. So um, at runtime, just adding like custom classes to these uh, visual elements and then uh, creating selectors to basically style uh, each of the nodes differently depending on uh, what state they're in. Cool, so the first step is to open up the node view class and I'm just gonna create a new function here called update state. Um, and all this function is basically gonna do is just do like a switch statement on the node's state to begin with. So inside each of these cases, we just need to do pretty much exactly what we we're doing here for the setup classes. Um, where we created like a different class for each type of node, but instead we're just gonna create a different class for each uh, each state that the node is in. So um, we're gonna have running, failure, and success. And I just, I'm just i gonna wrap this whole thing inside application.isPlain, and because I really only want these states to exist when the editor, um, or when we're actually in play mode, uh, because in edit mode, I don't really wanna display any of this stuff. Um, so last thing to do is just uh, call remove from class with each of those uh, class types. This is just so like when we change from like running to failure, we we only ever have like a single class attached to attached to the node. And uh, finally, one more thing is I'm just gonna inside the running state just check if the node is actually started uh, because I think the default state for the node is actually running even if it has never been run before. Uh, so. This just means that it won't get the, the running state unless it's truly running, basically. Cool. So yeah, this was on the node view class. So now in the behavior tree view, uh, we just need to create a new function here called like update node states. And all this is gonna do is just loop over each of those nodes calling that function. So just uh, this old chestnut here that I think you've probably seen a thousand times by now, um, but we just take uh, the node and cast it to a node view and then here we just call node view dot update state brilliant and finally we just hop up to one more level to the behavior tree editor itself and here i'm just going to override the on inspector update and this function gets called at like 10 times a second for an editor window which is not terribly fast so this whole thing is not going to be super responsive but for now i think it's good for illustration purposes so here, um, oh, I might just call that update node states. Yeah, so here I just wanna call that function on the tree. So let's get tree view and then just call update node states. Sweet. So now if I go back to the editor and go into play mode, we should actually see those, um, 
those node states appear. So if I just go to the UI toolkit debugger, node view, we can actually see running and success, etc., which is pretty cool. Um, so we can actually start styling this stuff like straight away without even coming out of play mode. Uh, so I'm just gonna create a new visual element and I'm gonna drag it to the top here. And this is going to be the node border. And I want it to be pretty much the same size as the selection border, um, but I'm gonna color the background instead. So, oh, not node border. This sh I'm gonna call this uh, node state. Cool. So for this one, I just want to create like some default styling. So I'll just start by targeting the node state like this. And here, uh, just needs to do a few things. Just set the position to absolute, set all these to zero. Um, I can just set the background to like something so you can see it to start with. Cool, we can already see that's looking okay. And then I'll set the border radius to like five. Sweet, and I'll just unset that for now um, because I, I want the default state to be off basically. Now creating some new selectors, one for the running, uh, the running state for the node. This one, I'm just going to set the color to like yellow, I think looks cool. Awesome, and we can already start to see the, like we can already see that this sort of portion of the tree is currently executing. So these ones are all succeeded, every frame, they, they're just constantly succeeding basically. So let's have a look at those. So if we just uh, create a new selector with the success state for the node here, I can just set this to green and now we can actually see these have a success state which is pretty cool i'm just going to dial the alpha back a little bit because i want it to be a little bit more um, dull compared to the running nodes because i think these running nodes are probably the most common case um, you, you sort of want to know exactly what's currently executing now cool and then one more for the uh, failure state failure node state I don't actually have any nodes that fail in this tree yet, but I'm guessing it's just gonna work like the, the success one. So I don't really need to show that. Cool. Um, so yeah, one more thing. I'll just come out of this and just to kind of give like a cooler demonstration, I'll just create like a couple more sequence of nodes, uh, link these up like this. And yeah, I'll create like some, like a debug log node and a wait node over here and link this guy up still need to work on that picking it's not um it's not super accurate or uh, i mean it's too accurate i think <laughs> need to make it a little bit more lenient but yeah cool so now if i hit play mode we can actually see dun, 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 these portions of the tree like flicking back and forth uh which i think is totally awesome sweet so yeah that's pretty much it for this section Blackboards are actually a really simple concept. They're just a container for a bunch of variables and each node in the behavior tree has got access to the Blackboard. So it's able to read and write the variables that are, that are within it. And this basically allows nodes to pass uh, information to each other uh, from any level in the tree. So quite often um, blackboards are stored or they're, they're implemented using like a dictionary or a map or something kind of similar where each uh, key represents like the name of the variable like position and then each value is like a vector three or a float or, or whatever. Um, and that's quite a generic sort of solution but I'm actually just gonna do something much simpler um, because I've only got one behavior tree and one type of agent at the moment so I don't need all that flexibility and I just want to focus on the way the blackboard sort of integrates with the behavior tree how the nodes get access to it and how they can read and write the variables and also displaying the blackboard in the inspector so the first thing I'm going to do is uh, create a new C sharp script called blackboard and this is basically yeah going to be the container for all of the sort of runtime variables that the nodes want to uh, write to so we can just delete all of this stuff, uh, get rid of the mono behavior and uh, just tag it with system.serializable. Now the next thing I'm gonna do is just create two like example variables like uh, move to position, which is obviously pretty common in a behavior tree and move to object. Um, this one's slightly different. It just means if a node is moving to an object like collecting a pickup, then it's able to uh, basically check if that game object has been destroyed and then return failure from the node if, if it was destroyed, for example. So we just need to create an instance of the blackboard now. So just inside the uh, behavior tree, just at the top, just create a new um, property 
new blackboard, yada yada, <laughs> and cool. So now we have a blackboard in the behavior tree. Um, but the nodes still don't have access to this yet. Um, so I'm gonna create a couple of properties. Uh, the first one is going to be the blackboard itself and we'll initialize this for every node in the tree in a minute. Uh, the second one is going to actually be the agent. Um, so at the moment, the AI agent has got um, access to all of the subsystems like the sensors, the weapons, health, etc. So it's gonna be pretty important that the nodes have access to that as well. Sweet, so the next bit is uh, just assigning these um, these properties for every node in the tree. So we previously wrote a traverse function here and we can uh, pre just use that function to basically traverse the entire tree assigning those properties. So I'm gonna call this bind and it's gonna take in an agent as a parameter. Uh, let me scroll down a bit. And all we need to do now is just call the traverse function starting from the root node of the tree and just using the Called lambda syntax again um, we just assign the agent to each node and also the blackboard whoops this microphone keeps getting in the way i need to <laughs> I need to do something about that um, cool so yeah that's it for the binding part now finally we just need to call this and we'll call this from the behavior tree runner component and here we can just call tree.bind passing in um, the agent so we can just get the agent as a component because uh, it will be on the same game object as this component here. Sweet, um, so that's pretty much it for <laughs> the blackboard. Um, yeah, you can just add all of your own properties in here, whatever makes sense, like um, number of times that agents died or just, yeah, like what, whatever kind of makes sense, uh, you can just add into here. So uh, how to read and write the variables um, from the like every node basically inherits from nodes, so they have access to those uh, those two properties I just created. Um, so for example, if we just wanted to read like the blackboard um, move to position, we can just do it like that, uh, blackboard. And yeah, similarly, uh, if you wanted to write to it, you just write to it basically. Sweet, okay, cool. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much it for the backend kind of part of it, uh, pretty simple at the moment. Um, so the next step is just to basically render the blackboard property of the behavior tree down here in the inspector. So I'm gonna open up the behavior tree editor in UI Builder. And first thing I'm gonna do, well, what I wanna do is create a two pane split view, uh, just a vertical one this time. Um, but before I do that, I just need to um, basically encapsulate these two objects in a container because uh, the split view has got to have exactly two children. So uh, I just need to, create a top level container so this is just going to be called inspector container and then what we can do is just drag in a split view into the left panel of the parent split view drag in the inspector container to the split view and now i can create another container drag that into the split view as well and this time i'm going to call this uh, blackboard container don't even know if i spelled that right i can't see yeah that looks right cool and now for the split view, we just set the orientation to vertical and uh, we can now change the, the sort of the split position. Okay, so I'm just gonna drag a label into the blackboard container and I'll give it the same background color as this guy here. And I really wanted to actually render the blackboard property. I really wanted to use this property field, but it's causing me some headaches. So um, instead I've had to use the I am GUI container, which is another cool, uh, uh, sort of widget that comes with uh, UI Builder. So this just lets you execute like your standard editor GUI container, editor GUI layout logic, stuff like that. Um, cool, so I'll show you how to do that now. Um, that's pretty much it for the, oh, one more thing. Sorry, I'll just rename this label to Blackboard. Cool, sweet. Okay, so save that. Um, now, opening up the behavior tree editor, the main window here. Uh, we can just create a new property here. Um, I'll just call this blackboard view. And this is gonna be of type I am GUI container. And we can initialize that inside the create GUI method here. So I'll just copy that line, change this to I am GUI container and change this to blackboard view. Sweet. Um, so to actually render the property, we need to create a a serializable object um, so I need to create one of these here and I'm just gonna call this like tree object 
and then from that object we can get the blackboard property as a serialized property uh, and I'll call this blackboard property. Sweet, so we just need to initialize these things every time the selection changes, every time we select a new behavior tree. So I'll just do this at the bottom here. So if we have a tree, then basically create a new serialized object passing in the tree. And the blackboard property we can initialize just by uh, finding the blackboard property like that. Sweet. Okay, so the last step is um, this Blackboard view is an IAM GUI container and it has a property on it called I, uh, on GUI handler. Uh, so this again is a Lambda function. Um, so we can create a Lambda and now inside here we can just execute whatever um, like it is a GUI layout logic that we want to. So I'm just going to create a property field using the Blackboard property. Um, we also need to, uh, from the tree object, we just need to update that first just in case there's been any changes in code uh, so have that reflected before we render the ui and then finally we can just call tree objects dot apply modified properties which will apply any changes we make in the ui back to the <coughs> the uh, serialized object sweet so i just compile this and switch back into unity make the scripts reload they love doing that uh, the behavior tree editor so now if i select this we can see the blackboard appears here, and I think I forgot to <laughs> save the, the XML before. Um, but yeah, what is this complaining about? I don't know, let me just clear that out. I think that was some intermediate problem, sweet. Um, cool, so now if I set this to like one, two, three, and hit play, we can see that X value uh, going up. All of the debug log nodes are just incrementing this, this X value here. And uh, I can also change these values and inside the console, we should actually see the new values uh, getting rendered here, which is pretty cool. So that is a really simple implementation of a Blackboard. So for this last section of the video, I just want to cover how to set up data binding in UI Builder uh, to basically bind a scriptable object property to the label text that you can see here. Uh, so first thing we need to do for that is um, inside the node class, just create a new property to actually bind to, which is going to be uh, the description text itself. And I've just given it the text area attribute here. So it spills over multiple lines in the inspector. Uh, next, we need to get a, um, a handle basically to the uh, description label um, using this dot query passing in the type and I'll pass in the name of the UI element which in this case is description um, which we created earlier and we need to set the binding path uh, binding path equal to the name of the property which is also description but this this string here refers actually to this property here whereas uh, the string is referring to the name of the UI element um, Lastly, we need to call a method dot bind, but for that we need the Unity editor UI elements namespace. Um, so just added that there, and now we can call dot bind, and this needs a new serialized object of the object that we're binding to, which is uh, the node itself. Cool. So switching back into the editor now, um, <clears throat> just let the scripts compile for a little bit. Okay, cool. So um, now if I type, this is a huge description. Yeah, we can now see it's um, it's all working nicely. Uh, except if I uh, <laughs> type a really massive description, then the, the node just expands. So we need to set up the text wrapping for this. Uh, so in UI Builder, um, just in the USS style sheets, we created a description selector earlier. So for this, um, you just need to set text wrapping, but I found that I need to kind of select it and then reselect it for it to actually work. The other thing to do is in the um, size settings, I'll just set a maximum width of like 150 and hit save and now in the behavior tree editor we can uh, we can see the text is actually wrapping nicely there cool so that pretty much wraps it up for this video uh, if you're still with me then really appreciate you watching uh, and yeah make sure to subscribe to stay tuned with the latest videos and stuff that i'm going to be releasing and uh yeah the next episode or the next video is going to be on um, actually starting to use this behavior tree editor to actually implement some proper like behavior trees for the agents at runtime, which I think is going to be uh, really exciting. So we'll see you then. Kakite.